I am Dr. Erica Cesari. I am a science fellow for Bush Heritage Australia. I'm based out of Hamlin Station in Shark Bay, Western Australia, and I did my PhD on the Hamlin Pool stromatolites. What is a stromatolite? The technical definition for a stromatolite is an organosedimentary deposit that accretes by the trapping and binding of microorganisms or the precipitation of calcium carbonate through metabolic processes. Okay, so how does um, a stromatolite accrete? So this is actually a model from the Research Initiative on Bohemian Stromatolites, and this is a picture of a stromatolite, a cross-section, you can see the lamination, and then the little white box on this stromatolite you can see off to the left-hand side, and the modeled bits are uh, trapped and bound sediments, those are sediments, and the blue lines represent um, macritic lamination, so laminations made of cement created by microbes. And at the surface of the stromatolite, you can see that there's a bit of a microbial mat. And each interior lamination on the stromatolite is evidence of a former surface mat. And that mat is made up of microbes. And if you look over to the right-hand side, you can see a filamentous cyanobacteria. In the top picture, there are little green ones. And in the bottom picture, you can see their little filament. They're wrapped around these blue grains, so those are the sediments. So you can see how they kind of trap them there in the surface, and the microbes are photosynthesizers. So they want to take their energy from the sun, and if the sediments are covering them, they want to get to the top of the sediments, so they kind of creep up on top of the grains and bind the grains down so that they're at the surface again and can photosynthesize. But I think one of the most important things that we need to remember about stromatolites is that they're actually trace fossils. In the upper right-hand corner, you've got um, a dinosaur footprint, and that's to remind us that a stromatolite is a trace fossil. So like the dinosaur footprint, it's not actually fossil evidence. It's not actually a bone. It's not, it's not part of the dinosaur. It's a footprint that's evidence the dinosaur was once there. In the same way, these laminations and stromatolites are actually evidence that the microbial community was once there. Something like 1% of known stromatolites have bacteria that's actually entombed as a fossil. So more than not, you just find the laminations in the stromatolite, and those laminations are evidence of a former surface mat. So the next point that I want to touch on is why are stromatolites important to Earth's evolutionary history? Um, so if we think about Earth um, in terms of this diagram, this is a diagram that's been modified by Dave Demeray you've got the different breakout periods. You've got the Hadean, which is the beginning part of Earth's history, and this is a time when Earth is beginning its formation, and that's about 4.5 billion years ago. And it's this really hot hell. During the later part of the Hadean, you've got, um, you've got impacts hitting the Earth all the time, basically evaporating all of the water up on the surface. It's like, the, it's, it's, it's literally hell on Earth. And then after that, the next period is the Archean. And that's a time of plate tectonics and, and early Earth starting to form. And then onto the Proterozoic and to the Phanerozoic. And, and I think if we add on this next bit, which is kind of uh, life here, this is how we, we get here. And th this diagram should actually be modified because there was a new discovery of stromatolites in Greenland in the Ishwa group. The first stromatolites are now dated at 3.7 billion years. Wow. So this diagram still depicts what we did know about stromatolites, which was the, the first fossil evidence of life were in stromatolites um, dated 3.45 billion years ago in the Pilbara in Western Australia. Um, but we actually think life started kind of closer to the beginning of the Archean, but we just don't have any fossil record of that. So the first fossil evidence that we have comes in the form of stromatolites, and that's now at about 3.7 billion years. And then move forward in time, and we start to get more complex organisms in the Proterozoic, and near the end of the Proterozoic, we get um, algae and things like that, but it's not until the Cambrian explosion, which is right where you see the Phanerozoic start to begin, where you get this radiation of life. And if you put this into perspective, if you, s if you stand and put your arm out to the side 
and start time at your nose and move all the way out to the end of your fingertips. If you took a shaving from your fingernail, that is essentially humans. That's our existence on this planet. Now imagine 80 percent of that period is dominated by microbial life. That is stromatolites. So you've got all of this Earth's history that is nothing in the rock record but stromatolites. And if you look at this little red wedge right in here, that's dinosaur's existence right in the Mesozoic. And it's so funny because when we think about fossils, what do we think about? What's the first thing that pops to your mind is usually a dinosaur. When really the dominant fossil throughout Earth history are stromatolites. So what is the big deal with stromatolites? Oxygen. The big deal with stromatolites is oxygen. So this is an image um, from a subtitle stromatolite in Hamlin Pool. This is a stromatolite building microbial community that is actively photosynthesizing. And you can see all the little oxygen bubbles coming off the surface. Look at a diagram of early Earth. You have to excuse the simplicity here. But we've got, we've got um, these shallow seas all along the margin. You've got these microbial communities. And in this instance, in this diagram, they're building stromatolites. So you've got the, micro the microbial communities up here, and they're photosynthesizing. And they're putting out free oxygen into the ocean. Now, what happens with this free oxygen is that there's also a lot of free iron ions. And the oxygen and the iron come together and they make often rust, often iron formations, all the banded iron formations. And in Western Australia, where Western Australia's economy is built around iron. And if you go to a bunch of different locations around Australia, you'll see heaps and heaps of these iron formations, banded iron formations. And so who can we thank for that? Well, we can thank these um, microbial communities that are photosynthesizing and they're putting out all of that oxygen. So you reach a point when all of that oxygen is used up. It's all been, or all that oxygen has reacted with iron, all that free oxygen has reacted with everything it can do, and now we've just got free oxygen out there in the ocean. And the ocean reaches a point where it's saturated with oxygen and it can't hold any more oxygen. And where does that oxygen have to go? Up into the atmosphere. So now we've got billions of years of microbial communities photosynthesizing, saturating the oceans with free oxygen, and then oxygenating the atmosphere. So what was in early Earth a reducing volatile atmosphere with less than 1% oxygen. Now, over millennia, we've changed that to over 20% oxygen. And that change in the atmosphere is basically what allowed for evolution. So when you get to that so what question, you and I would not be sitting here today if it weren't for all that photosynthesizing activity from early microbial mats. Now we get to Hamlin Pool and why the stromatolites in Hamlin Pool are so significant. So if we look at a diagram um, of early Earth, this is uh, after Aramic, the one, the diagram on the right. So this is stromatolites through time. Um, you've got the, the first appearance of them in about 3 point, now we know, 3.7 billion years. And as you move up the diagram, you're moving up through time to the present. And you can see that as you start to move forward, they increase in abundance and diversity in, throughout the rock record. And then right before the Cambrian explosion, which is at 542 million years ago, you see a sharp decline. And so that's a result of, of higher life. So basically all this oxygen that the, that the microbial communities put out into the atmosphere, which allowed for the evolution of higher life, ultimately snuffed themselves out because when you start to get macroalgae evolving and you start to get higher organisms evolving, you start to create organisms that are better competitors, either for space or they also could be predators. These organisms could be grazing on the microbial communities. So essentially, once you get the more evolved life that's better suited for that environment, 
it kind of snuffs out the microbial communities that build stromatolites until they get pushed back into places where higher organisms can't live. Um, on the left is a mural at the Smithsonian depicting early Earth. It's painted by P. Sawyer, and you can see the volcanoes and the hot springs and the stromatolites. And then this is uh, the lower left is an image of stromatolites in the rock record. So if you think about that turnip diagram, the Aramic diagram, and, and stromatolites then have that pinch out right at the Cambrian explosion, we didn't know that modern stromatolites existed anymore. And in the 1950s, the first discovery of marine stromatolites was made in Shark Bay, Western Australia by Phil Playford. And then in the mid-1980s, they were found along the margins of the Exuma Sound in the Bahamas. And so those are the two marine formations that we still know of today. And there could be some other ones out there that we just haven't really discovered. In fact, there's also some marine um, stromatolites, but they, they occur in the super tidal zone, so they don't have that active um, interaction with the, with the ocean in South Africa. Um, so why do they exist in Hamlin Pool? Well, think about that turnip diagram again from Aramic, where you start to see that pinch out, where life has evolved and life either outcompetes for space or grazes upon the microbial communities and you see them disappear in the rock record. Well, for that same reason, they exist in Hamlin Pool. Hamlin is a really extreme environment. The average salinity in Hamlin Pool is 66 parts per thousand. Normal ocean salinity is around 35 parts per thousand. So Hamlin has a salinity a brown twice that of normal, normal ocean water. But the other thing that's interesting about Hamlin Pool is this range of salinity, is that we've captured readings as low as 16 parts per thousand. That's fresher than normal marine salinity. And then even up to 88 parts per thousand, which is really high. Then for temperature, you've got a range from 11 to 33 degrees centigrade over the course of the year. Um, and actually, the average temperature is 22 degrees as well. It cuts right in the middle. But if you think about a coral, a coral can usually live within a range of about 7 degrees centigrade. Um, some corals can maybe live up into a range of about 10 degrees centigrade. But generally, it's around 7. So Think about a temperature range of 22 degrees over the course of a year. So that's a huge temperature range for an organism to have to tolerate. And think about the fact that the organism is fixed. It's a benthic microbial community. It can't move. It can't swim to another location. It's stuck there to bear that temperature range. And then also, you have a tidal variation of around 2 meters over the course of the year. And I say over the course of the year because um, the annual tide is sinuous. Only 20% of the tide is based on astronomical factors. So if you look in a tide book, I can nearly guarantee you that Hamlin will not be doing what that tide book tells you. Because at the northern part of Hamlin Pool, it's barred by the 4A sill, which is a carbonate um, sand bank. Uh, it's colonized by heaps of seagrasses, and the seagrasses help baffle sediments as they go through. So this, this bank builds over time, and it restricts the water. Only, there's only one major passageway where water can flow through there, and depending on, on who you ask, it's either called Will Succeed Channel or, I think, Harold Loop Channel. I always call it Will Succeed Channel, it, after Joe Spaven's lighter back in the wool days. But... Because of that sill, there's only 20% astronomical forces. Then 20% is due to seasonal changes, and the other 60% is due to meteorological forces. So basically, if you look at what the wind is doing, you can tell pretty much what the tide is going to do that day, because it pushes the water. During one part of the year, you have higher high tides and higher low tides, and that is during the winter months, and during the summer months, you have lower high tides and lower low tides. And that also ties into your salinity fluctuations, which is very interesting. In Hamlin, you have higher salinities in the winter months and lower salinities in the summer months. Now that's counterintuitive, groundwater intrusion. So 
It's estimated that in Hamlin there are over a hundred million stromatolites that cover nearly the entire 135 kilometers of shoreline. And the yellow arrow here in the image is pointing to flagpole landing. That's where the boardwalk is. That's where the telegraph station is. And that's where the majority of research has been done for the last 50 years. If you go there, sometimes it's not that exciting. And if you don't know what you're looking at, it may be hard to really find that enjoyable. But if you know what they represent, all of a sudden, they become very important. And the other really important thing to think about is how these structures change when you get away from the boardwalk. This is a composite stromatolite. It's massive. This is on a super calm day. You can actually see my shadow standing on the boat in the right hand corner of the image. And these are basically big stromatolites that have grown in a cluster and they've kind of started to join together. And the fringe that you see along the margins is macroalgae. And that's um, just off Carbola Point. So these are on the east side in deeper waters. Uh, this is also on the east side further up. They're like tabular stromatolites that kind of all fit into one another. So those grooves are really caused by currents, uh, water direction, and the the elongation is perpendicular to shore. And then also you can see that there's macroalgae growing along the sides of it. But these stromatolites in slide 21, these stromatolites are on the western side of the pool, just beyond one of the, uh, just, just south of Snake Bank, which is the long promontory that protrudes there from the, from the western margin. And you just get heaps of these big platforms these are seeth stromatolites, and this is a really low tide day on the southwestern margin. And these lines of stromatolites extend for kilometers. And they're not parallel to shore, they're sub-parallel to shore. They're in a north-south direction, so they line up with the dominant wind direction for the year. There are lobes on the shore-facing side of the stromatolites that are perpendicular to shore, so in the direction of wave translation. So basically the waves that come in cut those fingers out and then the winds cause them to line up in the long lines. And you can also see in that slide that there was, there's a really low gradient as you go out. So imagine that with over two meters you've got that two meter tidal change over the course of the year. So at one time of the year, you can imagine that those stromatolites are covered nearly every day, or every day they get wet. And at another time of the year, they may be exposed for quite a long period of time. That's part of the extreme environment. These stromatolites, they are off Carbola Point. These are composite stromatolites. And they, are, they have this really macritic texture, so there's not a lot of trapped and bound sediment here. They're actually just this macritic framework. They're really interesting. So frameworks made by microbes, and they, they have a lot of macroalgae around the sides of them. And they're often bladed, and so they've got these like lobes that are in the direction towards shore. These are some of my favorite stromatolites. These I call elongate nested. And this type of stromatolite is found to the south of every promontory on the west side. And they just form these gorgeous, sometimes they're very low, like 10 to 20 centimeters in relief. And then in other areas, they can get up to, four, to 40 centimeters in relief. Beautiful elongations. They tend to be on the southern side of the promontories and the elongations are in the direction of shore, but it's right where that wave comes in to cut and turn at the promontory, and so that is a really strong current, and then that's a positive feedback loop, so that then will build up in that shape over time. These are the traditional stromatolites that we think about, these dome shapes, and you can see some of the fish that do live in there as well. And then here, these are some of the much taller ones. These are probably around 40 centimeters in relief, and these are also these elongate nested stromatolites. So these are up on the northwest side, um, below the Anchorage promontory. And here, these are more classic kind of stromatolites, that, that kind of column. But these stromatolites, you can see, have started to really flatten out and give it another 100 years. They'll probably all be connected 
into merge into one big stromatolite because they've started to flatten. When the stromatolite grows up, these microbial communities they get out of the range that's that's their proper growth range. So instead of growing up higher, then they want to spread out a bit more so they can have more surface area to photosynthesize. And when they start to spread out, then often they touch one another and they merge into one structure. And then that mat will kind of cover everything and make it one structure. And these stromatolites are just little teeny tiny baby stromatolites. There may be 10 to 20 centimeters in height. And there's just a new little nursery of stromatolites growing. So that's just kind of a, a touch of the different types of structures in there. And modern stromatolites were often believed to be not good analogs to ancient stromatolites because they're often so grainy. They trap and bind all these grains. And that is true. Stromatolites in Hamlin are often composed of trapped and bound grains. But these microbial communities build their own cement frameworks. In this slide, we'll talk about understanding early Earth and now Hamlin helps us do that. First, on the left-hand side is structure. In the top left, these are around two billion year old stromatolites from Great Slave Lake in Canada. And in the bottom picture, these are elongate nested stromatolites actively growing and accreting in Hamlin Pool. And you can see how that structure is very similar. So you can think about measuring in the modern the current, which direction it's going, and from that information you can imply what's happened in the ancient. This, the middle column is internal fabric. This is a 600 million year old internal fabric from a stromatolite in the Pilbara. The bottom row is an internal fabric from a modern Hamlin pool stromatolite. You can see that it's, it's not really grainy, it's got that internal mercritic framework, very similar to a 600 million year old stromatolite. And in the final column, we've got the biology. In the top right, nearly a 2 billion year old fossilized microbial community from a stromatolite. This microbe is Aoentophysalis. Now, in the next row, in the modern, this is an image of a bacteria that dominates nearly every single microbial community in Hamlin. It's Antiphysalis. That is the same microbial lineage. Hamlin is virtually a window to early Earth. Other applications for Hamlin pool stromatolites, and this is quite controversial, are looking for life outside of Earth. Now, microbial communities can often make what we call a biosignature. So stromatolites can be viewed as a biosignature. What does that mean? Well, in the images you just saw, there were a bunch of different shapes of stromatolites. So if you can predict or analyze that shape, then you've got the microbes making a signature in the rock record that sometimes predictable. So if you saw that shape somewhere else on another planet, say, then you know that you can hone in to that rock structure and that maybe you might find evidence of life there. So it's about looking at the microbial community, looking at what type of structure that microbial community is making. And if that structure makes a certain pattern, that then you can find somewhere else. So if you're looking for life on another planet, it's like finding a needle in a haystack. However, if you know what the structure you're looking for looks like, it makes that haystack much, much smaller. My name is Dr. Erica Sasari and I am a science fellow with Bush Heritage in Hamlin Pool working on the stromatolites. This paper was published in February in Nature's open access journal scientific reports called New Multiscale Perspectives on the Stromatolites of Shark Bay, Western Australia. This paper takes an entirely new approach 
to stromatolites of Hamlin Pool. The reason we were able to take this new approach on the stromatolites of Hamlin Pool is because previous research has always been concentrated to the southeast margin of Hamlin. If you look at this ground truth map of areas we've examined in Hamlin, you can see that suddenly we're not restricting ourselves to the southeast corner of the pool, but instead we search the entire margin. As part of the investigation that we used for the scientific reports paper, we took 45 stromatolite heads from Hamlin, a number of pavement samples, over a hundred sediment samples. We took single beam sonar from across the pool to build a bathymetry map and basically spent months of just towing behind the back of the boat to examine the stromatolite and sediment types. One, this is a brand new model for stromatolite growth based upon the Playford model. We've identified that there's a difference in microbial structures in Hamlin Pool. Some of the microbial mats are just forming sheets. They can be laminated or unlaminated, but they're unlithified to weakly lithified, and they're not accreting upwards. These sheets are not building structures. Then, as you move into the intertidal and down into the subtitle, the microbial communities are actually building discrete buildups. They're accreting and building up and making the shapes that we know as stromatolites. In the upper intertidal, we have pustular mats that the dominant microbe is Entophysalis. And Entophysalis makes an unlaminated internal fabric. In the lower intertidal, we have smooth mats dominated by coccoid cyanobacteria. They make laminated structures. And in the subtitle, we also have coccoid dominated cyanobacterial mats, but they're making kind of a jelly type of mat. This type of coliform mat makes a moderately laminated internal fabric. Another difference is that we find filamentous cyanobacterial mats are found dominantly in the upper intertidal, whereas coccoid cyanobacterial mats are found more towards the subtidal. Filamentous means they're filaments, they're like fingery. And coccoid are like their little balls of microbes. So this figure is about Entophysalis. Entophysalis is a coccoid cyanobacteria, and if you're American, Sometimes you say that Entophysalis. A comes from an old Aramic diagram, and it shows a living Entophysalis top. So this is a living coccoid cyanobacterium. And as it degrades, how that shrinks down. And that's what the cement forms around. What's happening in B? Oh, it's just really showing you the coccoids and the dead coccoids. And you can see the dark dead coccoids. Yeah. Those are what the the calcium carbonate is going to begin to per precipitate on. And what's C? See, you can see the the cement, the little white blobs of yeah. sediments that are being formed within this gel matrix. And what's D? D is this micrite, this calcium carbonate that's being precipitated around the dead coccoid cells within the organic matrix. This diagram beautifully shows the differences between the poorly lithified sheet mats and the microbial communities that are building stromatolites, so these lithified structures. So on the left hand side you can see smooth and pustular mats that are forming in the intertidal zone, upper intertidal. You've got just sheets of pustular mat and sheets of smooth mat and that smooth mat is formed by a filamentous cyanobacterium called microcoleus. This mat also has some schizothrix within it. Both are filamentous and they're not forming lithified structures. Then the postular mat 
is also making these sheets in the intertidal, and it's dominated by Entifasalis major and Entifasalis granulosa, and they're both little coccoid cyanobacteria, and they make this kind of squishy, bulbous, mammalate mat. But then, as you move deeper into the subtitle, you have another form of pustular mat, and this pustular mat, instead of just making sheet mats, suddenly the communities become more diverse, and that diversity is creating a lithified structure. I actually call this pustular mat crusty pustular because if you feel a pustular sheet mat, it's that soft, squishy material, but if you feel a pustular mat that's building a structure, it becomes a bit more jagged, a bit more rigid, crustier. And that has another cyanobacterium in its community that's not in the unlithifying sheet mat, and that guy is the filamentous cyanobacterium dicothrix. Then as we move a bit deeper, we have another smooth mat. But instead of being dominated by filamentous cyanobacterium, this smooth mat is dominated by coccoid cyanobacterium. But it's still building this beautiful sheet mat. It often feels a bit crusty or a bit leathery. In the subtitle, the stromatolites are dominated by a coliform mat, which is also created by a coccoid cyanobacteria. This coliform mat often has a gelatinous feel to it. In our Hamlin pool study, we sampled 45 stromatolite heads. From the 45 stromatolite heads, we made three slabs. Two, we impregnated with epoxy and ground down and polished, so they're museum quality slides. One has stayed in Australia and one has stayed in the US. The center slab, we cut into smaller pieces to make thin sections. So what this diagram is showing is that the top part of this stromatolite that looks green is just cement with not a lot of sediment incorporated. The center of the stromatolite, where the next thin section was taken from, has a lot of sediment in it. So you can see that that fabric is created by more of a trapped and bound mechanism. The next slide shows a different stromatolite taken from a different region of Hamlin Pool. The top image shows this clotted poloidal micrite and not a lot of sediment, but it's a totally different type of cement than the cement formed in the previous slide, which means that the mechanism of cement formation is different, which also means that the microbial community forming that type of cement is different. So within Hamlin Pool, we have a lot of different microbial communities and we have a lot of different processes that's generating cement that's building stromatolites. This diagram shows a shallowing upward sequence within the internal stromatolite fabric. The internal fabric of a stromatolite is a record of a former surface mat. So what you see in this picture is that in the subtitle you have a certain type of internal fabric being created by that microbial community. Once you get into a different photic zone, or once you get into a, a different area in the subtitle that's affected by the sun differently, that's affected by the water level, level differently, you get a different type of microbial community that leaves a different record, and so on and so forth. So as you move towards the, the intertidal, that community keeps changing, and that community keeps leaving a different record. So if you can unravel the different types of internal stromatolite fabrics, you can actually unravel where the sea level was when that type of fabric was created. This is showing that in a stromatolite you often have a shallowing upward sequence. 
So this means that as the microbial mat accretes, or as the microbial mat builds stromatolite, it grows upward. And as it continues to grow upward, those environmental parameters change, thus changing the microbial community and changing the type of fabric that that community is making. So this is a beautiful diagram to show the different types of fabrics that correlate to the different types of zones within the intertidal and subtidal. This diagram shows the microbial growth in Hamlin Pool over the last 2,000 years. Sea levels dropped in Hamlin because of two different things. One is ocean siphoning where water is being pulled out of Shark Bay and towards the equator as a result of isostasy where ice is melting at the poles and has been for the last several thousand years which is causing a rebound in the land towards the poles but that's causing a deepening of the basins near the equator. Therefore water is being pulled, a very very small amount of water, probably centimeters, but it's being pulled over thousands of years towards the equator and away from the bays. Another thing that's happening in Hamlin, and I believe a much more important thing, is uplift. So when the land is moving up, you're having a relative sea level fall. And because you pair these two things together, the sea level fall has been about a meter to a meter and a half over the last thousand years. What that has caused is the entire microbialite system to move seaward. And that's evident in this diagram. If you look at the top image, you've got stromatolites that are once growing in the intertidal area. Now you've got sea level fall, and we move to the bottom picture. Those stromatolites that grew 2,000 years ago are now left exposed, no longer living, and often eroding. Whereas the community that once grew in the intertidal in the top picture has now shifted seaward in the bottom picture, and those structures are now building again. So you've got, essentially, in Hamlin Pool, you have a system that's moving seaward through time. What will happen with Hamlin Pool as we move forward in time? Will sea level rise and will the system move back towards shore? Or will sea level rise and flood the basin with waters of normal salinity, causing the entire system to collapse? I guess time will tell. These diagrams are taken from Dr. Phil Playford's book published in 2013 called The Geology of Shark Bay. This diagram is a beautiful diagram about sea stromatolites. So we've looked at sea stromatolites in the Boulder province and we talked about them forming in long lines, in long rows that are subparallel to shore. And the reason for that is because of the wind direction. The wind direction dominantly comes from the south to the north. And when that happens, it rips across the water, especially during the summer when the waters are very warm and you have really low tides. And that wind direction induces paired helical vortices, which are known as Langmuir circulation. That enhances the long seaf structures. Uh, in the image on the right, it shows old Pleistocene beach ridges. So ridges that are formed about 120,000 years ago. And those form topographic highs. Stromatolite building microbial communities like to grow on hard topographic highs because that gets them a little bit off of the seafloor that keeps them out of those sand that moves around with the water. Because if you can imagine, if microbial mat colonizes mobile sand communities, then any time that sand gets churned up, that microbial community gets broken up. That mat is not able to retain its cohesive structure when waves and sands are moving. So a microbial community often colonizes that topographic high to get it out of that movement. So often you find that stromatolites are building over old 
relict Pleistocene highs. This slide is an image from the Boulder province, and you can really see this is about a, what would that be, about a kilometer? At the top is the main camel dray track where the camel used to walk out and bring the wool. So we walked down that track to get out to the subtitle stromatolites. But you can see that the whole area is dominated by these long seaf stromatolites. And as you move towards shore, these gray lines are an indicator of old stromatolites that are no longer accreting but are on top of those old Pleistocene highs, those old dunes. And so that's why they're forming in those ridges. Also, the sea stromatolites have these tuning fork junctions, which are also a good indication that they're driven by wind and Langmuir circulation. So you can see this, the Y shape in the image on the on the right. The image on the right, if you look to a lot of the stromatolites, those long sieve stromatolite bands, they have tuning fork junctions or these inverted Ys, which are also an indication of being influenced by wind. If you look at this image, you can see at the top of this rock structure, you've got huge boulders. We believe these boulders were placed there by a tsunami. In fact, a mega tsunami that had to have enough power and enough force to get those huge boulders up onto the top of that structure. In Hamlin Pool, there's also a lot of evidence of a mega tsunami. Around the southeastern margin, you've got a very large coquina ridge which is thought to have been put there by the mega tsunami. This is evident just behind the telegraph station. The big ridge that you have to climb over to get to the stromatolites is thought to be a mega tsunami deposit. Additionally, stromatolites accrete at very slow rates. And we believe that the stromatolites have grown in Hamlin for about the last 2,000 years. Based on our current knowledge, of stromatolite growth rates, some of the stromatolites are way too big to fit within that structure. So one of the ideas that we have is that possibly large boulders were moved into Hamlin Pool during a mega tsunami and the stromatolites accreted on top of those structures to form massive stromatolites. So the idea is that quite possibly not all of the stromatolite is microbial growth. Some of it may be a large boulder nucleus that stromatolites have grown on top of. And, and this I'm talking about stromatolites that are over a meter in height or, or a meter and a half in height. The image on the left shows the salinity regime of Shark Bay. So towards the mouth of Shark Bay we've got open oceanic type of salinity, so around 35. As you move deeper into the bay, you get metahaline waters, which are quite salty. And then down into Hamlin Pool and Laird and Bight, you have hypersaline waters. Hamlin Pool has an average salinity of 66 parts per thousand. In the right image, you can see the dominant wind direction. And in the summer months, the dominant winds in Hamlin Pool come from the south and from the southeast, which is really important when we think about sea stromatolites and how they line up. Also, in the winter months and in the afternoons, you get strong winds that come from the west. These winds pull water away from the western margin of Hamlin Pool and pile it on the east. Twenty percent of the tides in Hamlin Pool are due to astronomical forces. Twenty percent are a result of the seasonal differences, rain and evaporation. In the winter months you have higher high tides and higher low tides because the water is overall higher. And in the summer you have lower high tides 
and lower low tides because of the evaporation and not a lot of rainfall. So the overall water in Hamlin Pool is lower in the summer months. The remaining 60% is a result of meteorological forces, which is the wind. The water level in Hamlin Pool is controlled 20% by astronomical forces, 20% by seasonal effects, and 60% by meteorological forces like the wind and local pressure system.